Hello and welcome to the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the Executive Director of the Fellowship Program. The Radcliffe Institute brings together students, scholars and practitioners from across disciplines and professions to create and share transformative ideas. You can participate in this laboratory of ideas by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions or pursuing the special collection held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more about Radcliffe, please feel free to sign up to receive information on news and events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Professor Ira Dworkin. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce Ira Dworkin. He is Associate Professor of English at Texas A&M University and the ACLS Friedrich Burkhardt Fellow. Before joining the faculty at Texas A&M, Dworkin spent six years in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the American University in Cairo, in Egypt. Professor Dworkin's first book, Congo Love Song, African American Culture and the Crisis of, Colonial State, of the Colonial State, was published in the prestigious John Hope Franklin series at the University of North Carolina Press, uh, and was a finalist for the Polly Murray Book Prize in Black Intellectual History. Dworkin focuses on the specific history of the Congo, showing in persuasive detail how a number of African-American writers, missionaries and artists opposed Belgian colonialism and later US imperialism. Dworkin's comparative, uh, comprehensive knowledge of African history and archives has enabled him to thoroughly examine the history, literature, art and politics of the Congo. In so doing, he has changed scholarly thinking in African, on African-American writing for the 1880s throughout the late 20th century. Dworkin earned his PhD at the City University of New York. He was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship at the Université de Kinshasa in, Demo in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and served as Associate Director of the Center for American Study and Research at the American University in Cairo. During his time in Cairo, Professor Dworkin collaborated with local universities and NGOs, which exposed his students to the practice of achieving human rights as a complement to literary expression of these values. Dworkin is the editor of Daughter of the Revolution, the major nonfiction works of Pauline Hopkins, and Narrative of the Life of Friedrich Douglass, an American Slave. At Radcliffe, Ara is writing imperfectly known, Nicholas said, and the roots of African-American narrative. In this book, Ira traces the geographical narrative and textual roots of Nicholas said. Said was a writer from Bono in Northeast Nigeria, who was enslaved in Africa, Europe, and Asia before arriving as a freed person in the United States. In the US, he fought in the Civil War as part of the Union Army. Shortly after the war, in 1867, he published an autobiographical essay in the Atlantic magazine, followed by a full autobiography six years later, both of which examine race, religion, nation and citizenship, and other questions that are critical to the study of 18th and 19th century United States. Nicholas Said was a Muslim writer. In studying Said, Ira calls scholarly attention on the relationship of African and Islamic intellectual networks to black knowledge production in North America, putting renewed emphasis on the African of African-American writing. At the same time, he proposes a larger and more diasporic understanding of African-American writing in the 19th century and beyond. And now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Ira Dworkin. Thank you, Claudia, for that kind introduction. And thank you to everyone at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, um, fellows and staff alike, and also thanks to the American Council of Learned Societies um, and everyone who's here is spending time with me today. It really means quite a bit to me. 
Um, so my talk today is about Nicholas Said and what his literary career teaches us about reading Africa in 18th and 19th century Black American literature. Said was born into a distinguished military family in Bornu in Northeast Nigeria near Lake Chad. Um, and you can see that at the center of this map here. Um, and that's where he was captured um, by Tuareg nomads as a teenager and forced across the brutal Trans-Saharan Passage and was enslaved in Asia, Africa, and in Europe. Um, I'll show another slide as well, but before I go on, I wanna suggest his travels here are correct, although the dates are a little bit off. And this is from um, a map that, an excellent map that Alan Austin prepared, whose work I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so he was captured most likely actually probably in 1851. Um, and there are his travels um, in Europe, which you can see. Um, he claimed his freedom in 1859 um, found employment with a Dutch couple sailing for the Americas um, and arrived in the United States as a free person in December of 1859. In 1867, less than a decade after arriving in the United States, Said published his autobiography, A Native of Bornu, in the Atlantic Monthly, one of the most important white literary publications of the era. The editorial introduction to A Native of Bornu states that Nicholas Said, born Mohammed Ali bin Said, was known as a storyteller during the US Civil War when he enlisted in the 55th Massachusetts, a distinguished black regiment with white officers. It's widely assumed that one of his white commanding officers, probably Norwood Penrose Hallowell, arranged for its publication. While it appears that Said gained access to the Atlantic as a result of his military service, he actually wrote nothing about his experience of the war, creating a tension between, this, between the circumstances and the content of his publication. Instead, Said uses a native of Bornu to write his intellectual formation in his homeland in a part of the world that he recognized as, quote, imperfectly known to the civilized nations of Europe and America, end quote. Armed with his U.S. bona fides as a war veteran, Said uses the pages of the Atlantic to inscribe African intellectual history onto a site of European American ignorance in a manner that resists easy incorporation into a U.S. national project. He undertakes similar work in a later autobiography. Um, you can see the cover page here, which was he published, self-published by subscription in Memphis in 1873. The autobiography of Nicholas Said, a native of Bornu, Eastern Sudan, Central Africa, um, which we have available to us thanks to precious Rashida Mohammed, who uncovered and in the year 2000, published it in a new edition, which has expanded our appreciation of Said's life and literary career. I first encountered Said in the spring of 1991 in an undergraduate course at Wesleyan University taught by Michelle Steptoe, Slavery Written and Revised, which in addition to reading many of the classic slave narratives also included more recent black novels of slavery from Margaret Walker's Jubilee to Toni Morrison's Beloved by way of Shirley Ann Williams, Octavia Butler, Charles Johnson, David Bradley and others. In the back of one of the critical texts that we've read, the 1985 collection, The Slaves Narrative, edited by Charles T. Davis and Henry Louis Gates, Jr. There was a short bibliography, which is not even listed in the table of contents, African Muslims in Antebellum America, prepared by Alan Austin. I found this bibliography to be remarkable, a material archive of African Black American culture at a time when many scholars, um, frankly, in many cases in a backlash against Afrocentricity, presumed that Africa could only be an unrecoverable, romantic, or imagined space detached from this material world. From all of the sources in Austin's bibliography, I was drawn to Said for a number of reasons. He wrote in English and within familiar conventions of narrative autobiography, yet his story was animated by a central tension between the questions of how do we in the United States read Africa and how do we read the United States? While it might be tempting to read his story like those of other African Muslims as something exceptional, I was most struck by the way that he so clearly and consciously was part of a black American tradition, which is the argument of the master's thesis that I wrote on Said at the City College of New York, directed by Gordon Thompson, um, that drew on important then new scholarship um, by in the African diaspora by R.A. Judy and Paul Gilroy, along with historical studies by Michael Gomez and Richard Brent Turner. In discussing Said's roots, um, R-O-U-T-E-S here with a nod to 
Gilroy, I want to simultaneously claim his roots, um, R-O-O-T-S, via Edward Glissant's conception of the rhizome, which he defines as an enmeshed root system, a network in which it may be impossible to isolate a single thread or lineage. And the quote you're seeing on your screen, the notion of the rhizome maintains therefore the idea of rootedness, but challenges that of a totalitarian root. Rhizomatic thought is the principle behind what I call the poetics of relation, in which each and every identity is extended through a relationship with the other. As part of this process, I want to think about Said in relation to some of the originary moments of African American literary history, such as Phyllis Wheatley Peters seen here, who's frequently cited as the first Black American author to publish a book in English, her poems in, on various subjects, religious and moral, which appeared in London in 1773. She came to the British settler colonies of North America from Senegambia and West Africa in 1761 at the approximate age of seven, which means that she would have been born in 1753. Yet, as Houston Baker pointed out in The Journey Back 40 years ago, quote, most of the poet's critics have taken as a donné the child's culturelessness, a lack it almost seems of even the rudiments of humanity, such as language. It is impossible, indeed it is almost certain, that Wheatley, like thousands of other Africans kidnapped for the New World, spoke at least one African language. Baker's observation is indisputable. Wheatley Peters' first language was not English. In addition, she was of an age when she may have attended school and perhaps been literate in a non-European language. Still, Wheatley Peters' most recent biographer can use the passive voice to claim on the opening page of his book that she, quote, had been stripped of her African identity, which I take to mean that her African identity is illegible to him. However, if we return to Austin's bibliography and look at what historian Rudolf Ware describes as the whole and partial copies of the Quran found throughout the historical record of slavery in the Americas, we can appreciate that, quote, West African Muslims who underwent this process of embodied knowledge transmission um, in West African schools became the books they studied. They were walking Quran. The manuscript copies of the Quran and the fragmentary legal text that produced under the most difficult circumstances imaginable bear witness across the centuries. Knowledge produced within the self in this way was tenacious. How can we locate this kind of knowledge in the writings of Wheatley Peters, whose most famous poem on, bring, on being brought from Africa to America opens, "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, a line which seems to offer troubling praise for the transatlantic slave trade and its accompaniment of Christian salvation. If we turn to the poet June Jordan's brilliant 1985 keynote address, The Difficult Miracle of Black Poetry in America, or something like a sonnet for Phyllis Wheatley, readers can appreciate the important ways that the octet's fourth line, once I redemption neither sought nor knew, rejects the presumptions of European slavery. Um, here is a manuscript, um, a slide from the June Jordan papers actually at the Schlesinger Library of the Radcliffe um, of her um, remarks that she wrote and she wrote them in January of 1985. Um, and you can read the highlighted, or I put the highlighted portion there. Quote, once I redemption neither sought nor knew, as in once I existed beyond and without these terms un under consideration once I existed on other than your terms. For me, I mean, I have to say, this is one of the most stunning lines of literary interpretation I think I've ever read. Um, Christian redemption is a European formulation. And in this line, Wheatley Peters refuses to concede any pretense of its universality. With Wheatley Peters' insistence that there was something before redemption was even an idea, let alone a goal, she directs readers toward an African ontology that demands recognition, understanding, and study, while critiquing American attempts to incorporate fundamentally African forms of knowledge on structurally unfair terms, a critique that remains applicable to the efforts at incorporation into a seemingly liberal US multicultural project today. How do we locate Wheatley's terms if much of her life remains lost or illegible to traditional modes of literary and historical scholarship? To begin to answer these questions, we can learn a lot from generations of black poets like Jordan, um, as well as from Robert Hayden to E.B. Shockley, Kevin Young, Eve Ewing, Honoré Fanon Jeffers, and Tiana Clark, 
all of who in their own ways model this work as a poetic project in ways deserving of continued engagement and reflection, similar to the ways that Margaret Walker, Octavia Butler, Toni Morrison, and others have illuminated the tradition we call the slave narrative. Indeed, another compelling element of African-American literature's enmeshed root system, which can be found in the trope of the talking book that Davis and Gates used to frame their book, The Slave's Narrative, begins with James Albert Ukasa Gronya Saw's 1772 narrative. In their introduction, Davis and Gates focus on a critical passage in which Gronia saw sees his enslaver reading the Bible and later places his ear upon the book in an unsuccessful attempt to make it speak to him. Gates later describes the talking book as the central trope of a tradition with literacy at its center, a scene which illustrates, quote, the curious tension between the black vernacular and the literate white text between the spoken and the written word, between the oral and printed forms of literary discourse. Following where and the passage um, that I cited before, however, the oral and written have a longer and dynamic history in Africa. The critical importance and literary breadth of Gronyasaw's talking book is evident in its appearance in the works of several other black writers of the era, probably most famously Alauda Equiano. However, in the interest of time, I'm going to forgo a detailed reading of this passage and turn to another scene from the narrative in which Gronia saw rejects appeals by his later enslaver to embrace Jesus Christ as his father because he explains, quote, I told him that this must be a stake, mistake, that my father lived at Bornu, and I wanted very much to see him, and likewise my dear mother and sister, and I wished he would be so good to send me home to them. Gronia saw his resistant to Christianity, again reminding his interlocutor of his home in Borno and mentioning, quote, all I could think of to induce him to convey me back. Gronia saw insisted on and acknowledged Borno as his home from the very first sentence of his narrative, which is significant for at least two reasons. First, Borno was also the homeland of Nicholas Said, though a century later in what was by then a very different polity in ways that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Second, Bornu was an Islamic state and had Muslim rulers since the 11th century, and according to Usman Umar Khan, was the most important center of Islamic culture in the region from the medieval period until the beginning of the 19th century, which means that Gronya saw was probably Muslim and no doubt familiar with the written word. Based on the intellectual history of his homeland, which is well known to generations, thanks to generations of Nigerian historians, it's highly unlikely that Gronya saw didn't know what a book was, so his naivete seems to be performed for his enslavers and or his readers. Though central to the tradition of the slave narrative is articulated by Davis and Gates, Gronia saw does not appear in Austin's bibliography of African Muslims. And as a result, we have a tradition that sees African Muslim writings as a discrete category in a way that I believe results in their marginalization within or exclusion from a longer literary history. Here I want to follow something that R.A. Judy discussed in a recent interview I heard in recognizing how Julie Dash's 1991 film, Daughters of the Dust, incorporates Islam, quote, in precisely the way I was trying to articulate in the book. Um, here Judy is referring to his groundbreaking 1993 book, Disforming the American Canon, African Arabic Slave Narratives and the Vernacular. In the interview, Judy continues, that is casually, not as exotica, but as an element of the normal consciousness. Here, I want to build on an argument that Ala Arreyes makes in the introduction to his 2011 translation of the autobiography of Omar ibn Said, who was born in Futatoro, Senegal, and enslaved in North Africa. Omar, um, who you can see here, has gained increased visibility recently due to the acquisition and digitization of several of his manuscripts by the Library of Congress, um, and these are all available publicly. Omar ibn Said incorporates the chronic chapter on Mulk in his 1831 narrative, arguing that God is the only owner. Mulk in Arabic comes from Malika, which means to own and have dominion, which is a very effective anti-slavery argument. It is also, Alreas asserts, very similar to the argument that the abolitionist David Walker makes in his 1829 appeal, which insists that, quote, God Almighty is the sole proprietor or master of the whole human family. There are multiple possible explanations for this confluence. Perhaps Omar ibn Said was familiar with Walker's appeal and selected this particular verse on that basis. Alternately, Alreas asks, 
What if a particular Muslim argument against slavery, which finds its expression in Surat al-Mulk, has spread orally and was incorporated by Walker in his appeal? Building on Al-Reyes's observation, there are other intriguing possibilities regarding this use of Surat al-Mulk within the Jakanke clerical community, which was influential across several regions of Senegal during this era, Surat al mulk serves as the capstone to the first of five stages of Quranic memorization, organized not by textual order, by rather by degree of difficulty and other considerations. For a figure like Omar, educated in Futatoro, it seems possible that he chose to begin his autobiography with this verse, not solely for its discursive meaning, but also as a marker of his education level in a manner that would have been recognizable to other Africans educated in Jakanke schools. David Walker was personally acquainted with at least one other product of Jakanke educational lineage, Ibrahima Abdurrahman of Futa Jalan, Senegal. Ibrahima led a fundraising campaign to emancipate his family from slavery in the US, which included an 1828 speaking tour that included a stop in Boston, um, in which David Walker served as a marshal and which was covered in Freedom's Journal. And you can see the page here. Um, and Walker was a contributor, frequent contributor and a founding supporter of Freedom's Journal. Indeed, Abdul Rahman's father's uncle, Karamoko Alpha, was educated in, in um, Chikanke schools, is credited with establishing the first Islamic Republic in Futa Jalon in 1727. And in 1766, he was succeeded by Abdul Rahman's father, Ibrahim Asuri. Despite their shared lineage, Suri, Abdul Rahman's father, emerged from a military background and is recognized as redefining his uncle's spiritual jihad and struggle in terms of what Walter Rodney described as more militant commercial pursuits. Um, in other words, expanding an educational center into um, a commercial one. This political shift is important because it points toward the religious origins of more secular forms of political leadership in ways that might be instructive for a 19th century black political culture in the United States. While none of this should be interpreted as evidence that Walker was consciously drawing on particular African traditions, it does enable us to think about intellectual formation casually in Judy's term or rhizomatically in glissants, rather than as something contained within a narrowly delimited non-porous lineage. This can lead us to Henry Highland Garnett and later generations of Black nationalist intellectuals who Walker influenced through the political and cultural networks that Sterling Stuckey has tracked. Um, Stuckey, I should say, like Al Reyes, acknowledges Walker's connection to Ibrahim, if not the Chikanke, um, and the historian Craig Wilder's work um, is also um, incredibly instructive here as well. For Said, I want to provide this broader intellectual context, inclusive of Wheaton Peters, Gronisa, Omar Ibn Said, Ibrahim Abdurrahman, Walker, Garnett, and others, so we can think about Said in relation. Um, Bornu has a critical history, role in the history of Islamic West Africa and within the broader history of the Americas. Um, though it's far away from the region that dominated this transatlantic slave trade prior to the 19th century, Borno was a critical site in the landscape of what Khan calls West African cosmopolitanism, whereby Islam and the Arabic language were important means of regional communication, culture, and commerce prior to and independent of European colonialism. Although Borno was not, by most accounts, the homeland of a large number of people enslaved in continental North America, its influence was familiar in those regions that were. This dynamic changed as a result of the rise of the Sokoto Caliphate in 1804. Um, and you can see if you're looking at these maps, um, Borna was much larger in 1800 than it was in 1840, um, which was during, 1840 was during, of course, Nicholas Sayyid's lifetime. Um, most specifically in 1810, which um, is two years after the United States abolished the transatlantic slave trade, an invasion from Sokoto caused the Bornu capital, Bernie, Garzangarmu, which I can show you on the 1800 map. I think you can see my cursor there. Um, it displaced many people from there. And this had been the capital of Borno since the 15th century. So the capital was evacuated, led, which led directly to the capture, displacement, and increased vulnerability of people from Borno to the transatlantic slave trade. As a result, during this period, many were captured and enslaved in Brazil where the transatlantic slave trade continued for decades. Um, and there's extensive documentation of Muslims from Bornu participating in the great uprising in Salvador de Bahia 
in 1831. Anita of Bornu stands consciously at the margins of several prominent literary genres. It's a post-bellum slave narrative written in the United States by a person of African descent who was never enslaved in the United States. In the opening paragraph, Said begins with a gesture that demonstrates him to be familiar and adept with the established conventions of African-American narrative. He opens with the kind of apology that's pro forma of the autobiographical tradition, quote, reader, you must excuse me for the mistakes. However, within this first sentence, he pivots by explaining that English is not his mother tongue and that he never studied it in school. In the next sentence, he explains, the only, the only way I learned what little of the English language I know was through French books. In this opening paragraph, Saeed decenters English and clearly asserts his multilingual heritage. His linguistic flex skillfully engages West African traditions of life writing that foreground educational narratives, which is compatible with those versions of 19th century African American literary history that foreground the trope of literacy. This is when, after noting his fluency in French, he reports on the provincialism of Western readers, as I mentioned earlier. Then, immediately, then instead of immediately providing the autobiography that his invocation of I was born suggests, Said takes a deep dive into the political and military history of Bornu, describing his parents' lineage. His father was Barkagana, a high ranking military officer, before reasserting his birth two pages later. Then he returns to the question of literacy, noting that his 11 brothers were taught both Arabic and Turkish. Said himself received formal instruction in Arabic and Kanuri, his mother tongue. As Kali Yusuf Ghazali convincingly argues, religious scholars from Borno had traveled and set up schools throughout Nigeria um, in ways that had influenced Islamic learning in these areas for centuries, often in unmarked ways. Said's appreciation of the depth of his own literacy, however, does not protect him or otherwise provide a path to freedom, as popular readings of writers like Frederick Douglass sometimes suggest. Despite his education, he's captured during a party he organized during the holy month of Ramadan. In Tripoli, Said is sold to Haji Dawood, who he then accompanies to Mecca. Here, Said expresses his profound regret that, quote, I had not come of my own free will and for the express purpose of a pilgrimage and therefore was not permitted to go with Dawood to the grave of the prophet and was obliged to content myself without the title of Haji. For Said, his enslavement is not marked solely by the physical brutality which he experiences after his capture, but equally by his refusal of the opportunity to make his pilgrimage, which must be understood as the violence of slavery and the denial of his freedom, irrespective of his education. Soon after his denial at Mecca, Said describes his baptism into the Greek Orthodox Church, which includes his name change. Quote, I cannot help thinking that the way I was baptized was not right, for I think that I ought to have known perfectly well the nature of the thing beforehand. He is unwilling, he remains unwilling to embrace Christianity for requires or is otherwise built upon his ignorance. This is a good example of what historian Sylvian Gioff calls the pseudo conversions that African Muslims were often forced to perform. Writing six years later, Said describes the same moment, though set in Riga rather than St. Petersburg, he actually probably did convert Riga rather than St. Petersburg, as one to which he, whose assertions of autonomy are otherwise so thoroughgoing, he consented. Yet it remains a performance, which is followed by a prayer that enraged him, though in the end he, quote, managed to get through without any overt act of rebellion. In both accounts, Said's supposed conversion to Christianity is described with what can only be described as, I think, a profound ambivalence. Ultimately, it's an unrepaid loan to his white employer that forces Said to remain in North America unwillingly, not unlike the experience of Gronia saw. This is the exact moment where a native of Borno ends. Said, shown here in his military uniform, he does not incorporate the story of a Civil War service into his autobiography. His Civil War service cannot be integrated or assimilated. It's his continued economic vulnerability to white people that provides the most appropriate ending to a native of Borno. His 1873 autobiography also deliberately erases his Civil War service, but in a different way, by changing really the entire timeline of his life story. 
We might come to see Said's civil war experience like the remainder of his time in the US as a version of what the poet Kevin Young calls the shadow book, one variation of which is the unwritten text, quote, a book that we don't have but know of, a book that may haunt the very book that we hold in our hands. This is actually similar to the unwritten self that Baker describes in The Journey Back, quote, a self that exists outside the conventionally, the, a self that exists outside the conventional literary discourse structures of the white reading public. What if we read Said's refusal to write about the Civil War in the US as part of a broader refusal, his way of preserving an unwritten self that leaves us as readers with the shadow book? Simultaneously to this refusal, Said's narrative is American in deliberate ways. He frames his story through a series of direct allusions to the United States that are more academic than autobiographical. Mohammed al kanemi who like Washington and quote, all great men refused the scepter, um, is described as, quote, the Washington of Bornu, the man who undertook to liberate his country and restore her former prestige. This comparison posits that not only is Bornu a, quote, civilized nation, but moreover, its history compares favorably to that of the United States. Said's uses for the United States remain strategic. During his European travels, um, where he encounters the wealthy and powerful, Said experiences an epiphany. Quote, about this time, I began to think of the condition of Africa, my native country, how European encroachments might be stopped and her nationalities united. I thought how powerful the United States has become since 1776 and wondered if I were capable of persuading the kings of Sudan to send several hundred boys to learn the arts and sciences existing in civilized countries. In this passage, Said expressed his desire for the youth of his nation to be educated in, quote, civilized countries like the United States so that they can become better warriors with the resources to quote, contend against superior weapons and tactics of colonial forces. Here, the United States is not desirable as a permanent or idealized definition, destination, but rather as a source of technical assistance, which he would like to use for anti-colonial military purposes. For Said, military service, including his own record in the 55th, is more a part of an anti-imperialist training initiative than an American nationalist enterprise. Said's own military record provides additional insights. After rising to the rank of sergeant, Said requested a demotion to corporal so he could serve as a hospital medic. He changed his rank on September 1st, 1864, soon after the June 15th Army Appropriations Act, which publicly acknowledged the inferior medical treatment received by African-American troops. Said's decision to serve in a hospital unit represents a form of protest and a rejection of military conventions of advancement and promotion at a time when there were ongoing protests by soldiers over a range of issues, most prominently unequal pay. Military clampdown on black protests led to the June 18th, 1864 execution of Wallace Baker, a member of the 55th Massachusetts who served with Said and Company I. Um, Company I had about 100 members and was someone who Said had served with for over a year at that point. Um, and Baker was executed for refusing the orders of and fighting with a white commanding officer. But the soldiers in the 55th Massachusetts were undeterred in their protests as 74 members of Company D directly appealed to President Lincoln less than a month after Baker's execution on July 16th, 1864. Said continued his activism after his demotion and listed, was listed as an officer for an October 10th, 1864 celebration that took place when black soldiers finally received their back pay. Writing in the Atlantic in January 1867, less than a year before Said, amid debates about citizenship and suffrage, Frederick Douglass expresses his ambivalence about the opportunities available for African Americans after emancipation. Quote, Douglass writes, for better or for worse, as in some of the old marriage ceremonies, the Negroes are evidently a permanent part of the American population. Douglass's skepticism is shared by a Said. While it's not surprising that the Atlantic introduces Nicholas Said to its readers as a Civil War veteran, it's also not surprising that Said refuses the conventions of an aspirational American autobiography in favor of a story that includes at its core several generations of Borno history, his African education and literacy, his enslavement outside the United States, and his Islamic religious practices. In Black Marxism, the making of the Black radical tradition, Cedric J. Robinson considers, quote, how disengagement was the ideological currency of the rebel American Blacks, the absolute rejection of American society. 
end quote, which for Robinson takes its most pronounced example in the history of the Maroons. This framing of disengagement provides a critical method for reading black literary history as constitutive of something other than an American nationalist project. Despite a seemingly strong autobiographical claim for a place within what Douglas calls the American population, Said does not use the platform afforded by the Atlantic to make a case for inclusion, but as a site to inscribe African political history and educational practices in ways that serve as a kind of implicit rejection of American society of the sort that Robinson describes. By the time that a native of Borno appeared in the Atlantic in 1867, the magazine editors noted that Said, quote, married at the South where they entirely lost sight of him, end quote, which points readers in another direction, away from the Atlantic and its world and toward an appreciation of Said's life and literary career independent of this particular highbrow white milieu. At the time of its publication, Said was working in South Carolina, as were many black veterans of the 55th, and he was working to register voters. His supposed disappearance is instructive for understanding how his literary career was motivated by terms that differed from those of Atlantic, the Atlantic, a form of marinage where, as Neil Roberts explicates, quote, agents struggle psychologically, socially, metaphysically, and politically to exit slavery, maintain freedom, and assert a lived social space while existing in a liminal position. For Said's literary career, these experiences culminated in his decision to self-publish his autobiography by subscription in Memphis in 1873, far away from the world of the Atlantic. Until today, there remains uncertainty about the final decades of Said's life. A military record long repeated indicates he died in 1882, but more recent research by Paul Lovejoy indicates that he lived until at least 1896. As Carrie Hyde explains in her study of citizenship during this era, Quote, by the end of the Civil War, the aura of ideality that surrounded citizenship increasingly was reimagined as an extension of the state, and more specifically the nation, which is what I want to suggest that Said rejected. Based on the information that we currently have regarding the final decades of his life, Said moved south, where he married and taught school in Black communities. Said reaffirmed himself in the autobiography as a scholar committed to a belief that Derek Spires describes as constitutive of quote, black theorizing, whereby states do not make citizens active and involved individuals and collectives create citizens. Said recognized a sense of belonging to the Massachusetts 55th into Southern black communities in ways that he did not feel about the United States, enacting the kind of quote, homemade citizenship, a deep sense of success and belonging that does not depend on civic inclusion or mainstream recognition, end quote, that Caritha Mitchell writes about in her exciting new book. By way of conclusion, I want to ask if it's possible to rethink experiences of exclusion as histories of intellectual, cultural, literary, and political autonomy in which Said's decision to self-publish his autobiography expands the parameters of Black literary history. Reading Nicholas Said as a central figure in African-American literature, his disappearance from the view of the Atlantic Monthly is representative of a form of Black Atlantic literary marinage based in Black communities on the margins of white, political, white print culture within Young's shadow book, enmeshed in Guisson's rhizome, and ultimately beyond the United States. Thank you. And I will now turn the program back over to Claudia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ira. Uh, my apologies for mispronouncing uh, Nicholas Said's last name in my introduction. Sorry about that. Uh, we do have questions about your talk, so I'll go um, to the first one right away. What do you make of Said's use of Africa uh, to designate his country? Is this normative of the time period, or is it Said conveying something about the constraints of knowledge about the African continent among his English language readers? Thank you for that question. I mean, I think um, I would probably suggest that he's doing it in a sense that he's doing both. Um, and so I think, you know, I think I'd return to something that I mentioned probably too briefly, um, which is um, Khan's work on this idea of West African cosmopolitanism, right? So part of the way that I would think about it is that Said is kind of invoking um, Africa in a way within the context of the United States in which he understands his own individual heritage um, from, you know, coming directly from Borno as he did might be a little bit idiosyncratic, but recognizing it as part of this kind of broader landscape. 
Um, so, I mean, I think that's what I would say, but then it sort of, you know, we can see it again in the kinds of ways. Um, and this is, I think would be another kind of really, is another really important point of intersection. Um, if we think about sort of the designation of Africa in Walker and Garnett, um, you know, again, sort of reading through Sterling Stuckey and Craig Wilder's work in which we have this, and you know, probably Michael Gomez's as well, which we have this kind of formation of African particularly. So I guess I think um, maybe a more sort of succinct response is that I think he's probably doing both and he's really doing both with a kind of deliberation, right? One that acknowledged the particular um, intellectual history of Bornu, but also recognizing it as part of this broader landscape. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it comprehensible to imagine, uh, sorry, it is incomprehensible to imagine his anguish at witnesses, witnessing a son being forced to whip his mother to death. Is there more to this within the archival records? And was he uh, friends with this young slave being himself free? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again? So the question is, is it, it is incomprehensible to imagine his anguish at witnessing a son being forced to whip his own mother to death. And the second part of the question is, is there more to this within the archival records? And was he friends with this young slave being himself actually three? Um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think there's, I mean, so the sort of short answer is that I, there's not um, a lot additional that I've uncovered in the historical record or in the archival record um, about those experiences. But I mean, I do, one who kind of articulate the ways that um, I think what the questioner is getting at is the ways that the kind of violence that he's sort of writing about and talking about is, is in many ways incomprehensible, but it's also represented within the autobiography in ways um, as part of, I think, a larger, um, a larger landscape of violence. Um, you know, that he's sort of consistently witnessed to and experiences and encounters. Um, so it's, it's a short answer to an important question. Mm, yeah. Um, uh, why did he publish the book in Memphis? Do we know that? Yes, that's actually a good question. Um, so he published, so as, um, so he did spend time sort of speaking um, and traveling throughout the South after the Civil War and he would sort of visit um, white churches um, throughout the South. And it was um, a connection that he had made through a congregation um, that he had encountered um, elsewhere in the South. And so Shotwell, which was the printer in Memphis that printed the autobiography, was the printer who did a, um, um, was, was a Presbyterian affiliated um, printer. So you know, by subscription, um, subscription, I guess, publishing would be kind of this, this sort of, um, I, don't know, I guess it's like the GoFundMe of 19th century print culture. In other words, people would pay money for the book um, in advance of its publication. Um, and so that's how he organized the, um, that's how he arranged for it to be published there. So he didn't spend significant time in Memphis, but it was through this kind of Presbyterian um, network that um, he was able to get it printed there. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um... Uh, are Nigerian scholars aware of Said, and um, have they written about it at all? What yeah, so should I say about him? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so certainly Nigerian scholars are aware of him. I mean, I think um, you know, there's increasing work done. I sort of pointed to um, um, Precious Rashida Muhammad, who's um, Recovery of the autobiography has brought a lot of prominence to um, to Said. So um, Paul Lovejoy, whose work as mentioned, has been working with collaborating with a number of Nigerian scholars on this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, he's part of um, he is part of it. I don't know of any um, book length works um, by Nigerian scholars on um, on Said. Um, yeah, that, that's fine. Uh... Um, do we know what percentage of Africans enslaved uh, in the Atlantic slave trade, uh, in your estimate, were either literate or semi-literate? Oh, um, 
as you began that question, I actually thought it was going to be asking about the number who would have been Muslim. Um, so we, we have the, you know, the information that we have, we would have information for sort of local areas. Um, but in terms of the literacy, I'm assuming the questions about kind of literacy in um, Arabic or other African languages. Um, you know, the data that we have, um, a lot of it is on um, um, we, we have numbers of, and there, there's debates among sort of historians about the numbers of people who were brought to the Americas who were Muslim. Um, and then we can look at kind of what educational rates would have been in the communities of which, from which people originated, um, you know, and then the age and sort of also by gender, although um, late rates of literacy um, for um, girls and women was quite high um, compared to the United States at that point. Um, so I, I don't actually, I don't have um, a number, but I think it would have been significant. So one of the things that I think, so this sort of among scholars, um, and again, it's, it's a you know, debate among people, but certainly probably around 20 to 25% of um, people who were enslaved in, um, um, or who were brought across the transatlantic slave trade um, were um, from, um, Muslim regions, right? Or would have been, so rather than sort of identifying, sort of speaking in terms of an individual's precise kind of religious beliefs, but knowing that they would have come from these reg from regions. Um, so they certainly would have been, um, had some kind of exposure to literate culture. Um, so that would be a kind of another way of um, sort of thinking of thinking about that question. Perfect. Um... Uh, the next question is, uh, does it seem likely that uh, Said read Equiano's narrative? Parts of Said's narrative seems to signify on Equiano, for example, a dated baptism and the process of emancipation. Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. So, I mean, sort of my, the, the answer, I, I want to sort of say yes. Um, I mean, although there's no, I, there, there's no sort of documentation I've found for that. Um, certainly, Said was incredibly well read. He's certainly, you know, very directly, and this is one of the points I wanted to make, very directly engaging with the kind of canonical tradition of African-American autobiography um, that we would want to think about. Um, so, I mean, I, again, I don't have, um, you know, evidence that that's the case, um, um, you know, or sort of provable evidence, but absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that's part of, I mean, it's, I think it's quite clear that he is in dialogue with a number of other black writers um, who I've mentioned. Um, including, I should say, um, Equiano, um, Douglas, Mary Seacole. Um, so I think absolutely there's, you know, quite a good bit. So rather than, I, and I should say part of what I'm hoping to kind of communicate through this talk um, is that sort of even beyond my ability to kind of answer that one question affirmatively, I think, you know, we can, you know, much more definitively make broader kind of assertions about, you um, you know, Said's engagement with the, the, you know, with this broader intellectual and literary tradition of which um, Equian was a um, central figure. Um, the other thing I would add as well, I mean, so Equiano is kind of an interesting figure in the study because sort of Equiano's, um, um, you know, birthplace in, in Nigeria is from a, um, region that was not predominantly Muslim. There's no reason to believe that, um, you know, there's, there's no evidence to suggest really that Equiano was himself Muslim. Um, but it's also a region um, where, for instance, by the time of Equiano's enslavement, there would have been house and other sort of traders from Northern Nigeria, um, which is saying he's someone who might have been familiar, what he would have likely, I, mean, I don't think it's unreasonable to know that he would think that he would have known Muslims as well. And so when we think about Equiano's narrative as well, I and mean, we can think about the very particular and kinds of sympathetic portraits that he gets, um, that he, um, sort of writes about in his description, particularly in the Ottoman Empire, which is actually also a site of um, Saeed's travels. That's actually another point of engagement, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, really useful connection to make. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, can you discuss a bit more about, um, of his Islamic uh, era, erasure of Said and Wilfley? Um, I'm sorry, could, could you repeat the question? I, I want to make sure Can you discuss a bit more um, of this Islamic connection of Said and uh, Whitley? Uh, 
Oh, sure, 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 absolutely. Thank you. So I, I should say, so there's there's a few points um, for thinking about um, um, Phyllis Wheatley Peters is part of this kind of larger landscape. I mean, one is when we think about her again, and, and you know, this is a conversation that applies, I think, to Equiano in regards to the last question too, is we have these, you know, 18th century moments that we think about as some of the origins of African American literary culture. Um, and so the challenge becomes, in a sense, um, you know, we have someone like Saeed who's quite explicit and detailed about what it was that he, um, you know, where he was from and what he studied. Um, and we don't have that with um, Phyllis Wheatley. Um, but what we do have in her case is we have a whole bunch of, um, you know, white men from that era, um, you know, sort of making these kind of presumptions that Baker's talking about, um, but also trying to sort of create an intellectual genealogy that begins in the United States, right? Um, that it's somehow that she comes here and she's a complete blank slate when, you know, as I pointed out, um, you know, she was seven years old. Um, so she was someone who had familiarity with another language. Um, the reason, and so, and, and so there's, so there, that's part of it. I mean, there's other um, important connections to Islam um, that I didn't get into. Um, the scholar Will Harris um, has written a couple of really excellent articles about um, sort of considering um, the possibility and even the likelihood of um, Phyllis Peters' um, Islamic origins. It's something that um, Honoré Fanon Jeffers takes up as well in her remarkable um, book of poetry, um, The Age of Phyllis as well. Um, and part of the idea is that there are these ways that we can understand these particular intellectual genealogies as um, really kind of embedded and saturated within kind of black American culture in ways that I think what I'm trying to think about through Saeed, you know, he's someone who helps make some of that visible, um, but it becomes visible as part of this larger landscape um, in which that we can actually read Saeed, we read someone like Wheatley Peters um, differently in a sense, differently from how it's often read. And that's why I find June Jordan's, um, you know, line, once I exist no other than your terms, other than your terms is this entire kind of um, landscape for thinking about, um, you know, entire other landscape for thinking about, um, for thinking about her and her poetry. And it can lead us in all of these, I think, really um, interesting and valuable directions that haven't been fully explored. I mean, just to make a couple of other um, kind of quick examples of I mean, what that looks like, because there is a, not a lot of scholarship on Wheatley. Um, so um, I'm thinking of Baba Karam Bai's work, April Langley's work, Catherine Clay Bassard's um, work. Um, and a lot of some of this in thinking of Bassard specifically is thinking about um, her relationship with other Africans in, um, in you know, the um, New England colonies at that time. So we have some of her correspondence with Obor Tanner. Um, we certainly know she had relations with other Africans as well. And that's part of what gets left out of the sort of traditional kind of written record. We don't have a complete correspondence. So someone like Jeffers has in her book, um, a series of um, lost letters in which she kind of reimagines that correspondence. And Tiana Clark, who I mentioned has a series, um, which also has these really kind of interesting and brilliant gaps that represent another kind of shadow book of called conversations with um, conversations with Phyllis Wheatley as well. Um, so Wheatley is also a kind of in dialogue with Saeed is also a really useful place for understanding or thinking about the kind of archival project and the archival challenges of um, of you know Nicholas Saeed as part of this larger literary landscape. Right. Um, the next question, can you say a bit more about uh, Said, um, Said's view of citizenship and the basis uh, for his sense of citizenship in the southern United States? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I'm reading in part kind of one of the scenes that I mentioned was kind of his voluntary demotion in the military and his decision to return to the South after entering kind of this sort of, um, you know, the Atlanta the world of the Atlantic Monthly to the extent that he did, which is the kind of pinnacle of white literary culture. Um, and so, you know, there's so much, and, and I really, you know, I'm thinking again of, um, you know, some of the really great, all brand new, really 
scholarship that I cited at the end by Carrie Hyde and Derek Spires and Karifa Mitchell. Um, and so thinking about the idea of a citizenship that exists outside of the United States, right? That it's, it's a citizenship that is based in black communities, right? And it's how we can understand his commitment to the African-American men that he served with in the Massachusetts 55th and the commitment that he maintained to the black communities that he served during the war. Um, and so that's why he returned and it wasn't unusual for um, folks to return. I mean, during the end of the war, he was outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, you know, he was involved as were a lot of the other members of the Massachusetts 55th in, um, in sort of basically supervising the written contracts that um, between the formerly enslaved, um, and plantation owners in the region, sort of the labor contracts as well, um, which is another really important history. Um, so he saw him, I mean, right, so he had ideas of citizenship and um, belonging that weren't actually about um, the United States. And this is at the moment, um, you know, after the war that the whole idea of the United States and citizenship is becoming codified um, within both the national ethos and within, obviously within, um, within law in the 14th Amendment in ways that we're all kind of aware of. Um, so I think he was you know, really interested and grounded in these other ideas of community and they sort of have, and I think there's really important and useful ways to think about their origins um, in Bornu and in you know, how he kind of understood himself. Um, so, I think it's a, so I think it's a really, you know, I consider it to be a really kind of useful way for thinking about him um, and, you know, in, in this particular moment in ways in which I was trying to sort of draw the connection with Douglas, um, you know, in ways that I think sort of also sort of further places him in conversation with many other, um, many other African-Americans of, of that period. I think we uh, might have time for one uh, last question. What does Said's life and work say about uh, older academic models for the study of black life, such as African survivals versus erasure of uh, African identities or diasporas versus African-American exceptionalism. Does Said force us to change these frameworks? What a, wow, that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, sort of appropriate for an ending, but also I think appropriate for another kind of, um, um, you know, a longer conversation. I mean, I think sort of what the questioner is getting at is absolutely right. I mean, I think, um, so I mean, I think part of the idea is if we think about Said and we can think about, I mean, even in um, what might be more mundane ways, sort of elements of multilingualism, right? Um, what does it mean to kind of orient instead of um, to think, I mean, to go back to even Wheatley Peters, what does it mean to sort of say that to read her poetry in addition to kind of understanding British sonnets, we also need to understand sort of Senegambian poetic traditions um, and educational institutions and all of these other things that I think there's been a presumption of things that are kind of unknowable. Um, you know, the other thing that I think um, I mean, there, there's so many important answers to this question um, that I'm not going to really be able to um, get at. And, and I have to say, I mean, as well, I, mean, I think it's a project that a number of people have been doing. I mean, I think it's, you know, just to um, mention again, Sterling Stuckey, um, who's someone I've mentioned a few times, you know, whose work I think specifically hasn't really been taken up by, um, within the literary, um, by literary scholars, even though sort of his contributions, I think, in that area are kind of enormous. Um, but it has to do with kind of thinking about Africa, thinking about modern African history, thinking about pre-colonial African history, um, you know, in ways that are not, um, that I don't think are often placed in dialogue with the United States. I mean, I think I can, you know, I'm just to um, make another sort of, I mean, maybe as a way of another answer, if we think about Vincent Brown's um, recent book, um, Tacky's Revolt, I mean, one of the amazing thing that Brown does in that book, and I think makes it a model in the sense of kind of answering this kind of question that you're asking, um, is what does it mean to take seriously the kind of military history of West Africa during the Seven Years' War and understanding the way that that shapes formations in, um, in the Americas and in the, um, you know, in particularly in, in the Caribbean and kind of maroon communities and maroon revolts, right? The idea that there's this sort of transfer of knowledge that takes place and we actually need to understand and sort of take think about, um, you know, Africa in different ways um, has a kind of site of modern 
um, modern political thought, modern political struggle, modern military history, and all of these kinds of elements. Um, and so absolutely, I, I love the idea of sort of, um, you know, using say maybe as a, um, as a note for continuing to think about those questions. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Ara. Uh, thank you for uh, your thoughtful presentation. I also want to uh, thank you, our audience, for the terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Radcliffe virtual programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. And with that, thank you again for joining us today. Have a good rest of the day.